Hello, everybody. My name is Megan Munoz, and I am a certified diabetes care and education specialist. And I am incredibly excited to be part of this month's Taking Control of Your Diabetes and talking about driving away the blame and shame of a diabetes diagnosis. So without further ado, I'll give you a little bit more on my background, and we're just going to dive right in. So I have to kind of scoot me over here for a second. I am a nurse by trade. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in nursing. And I also have, in addition to the diabetes certification, I also have a certification in medical surgical nursing. And I work both inpatient and outpatient. I've done that for a number of different years in different settings. And since then, in the last year and a half, I've created and host a podcast for people with type 2 diabetes called Type 2 and You with Meg. So that's kind of what I do besides being a mom and <laughs> right now a teacher because of COVID stuff. So uh, busy, but an enjoyable, enjoyable type of work that I do. So today I want to present to you um, pieces of diabetes that maybe that ha uh, have not been traditionally introduced to you. So there's this road most traveled where there's a lot of beliefs and messaging about type 2 diabetes in particular. Um, but I want to challenge some of those. I want to take you down a little bit of a different path. And I want to look at data and studies and research and make it easy to understand, but use it in a way that gives you some insight to how maybe some of that messaging wasn't quite accurate. Um, and that, and in doing that, my hope is that we can start combating some of these stigmas that swirl around diabetes. So the road most traveled is pretty crowded. There's lots of messages. There's lots of um, beliefs about type 2 diabetes. So I want to explore a few of those so that you can see what we're going to challenge along the way. So the first kind of stop in this road uh, most traveled is this sign that says type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle disease. So I'm sure you've read that, heard that, maybe even felt that to be true that diabetes type 2 diabetes as strictly a lifestyle disease. And you'll see images like this that show up on social media or um, magazines, things like that. And this is a this is a image about diabetes awareness. Um, and the goal was to promote Diabetes Awareness Month last November or a couple of Novembers ago. But I think this message sends uh, this image sends a different message, which is that diabetes is about what you eat. And if you have complications of diabetes or diabetes itself, it's because you're addicted to sweets or you've made wrong choices in your life. Um, so even though something's sweet, you, you pretty much, if you have a complication, you're paying for it because you ate something sweet or you're addicted to sweets. So there's this lifestyle piece to that. There's also this too, sorry, you're gonna have to see me keep shifting lower and lower on the screen. Um, another, I think this is a Twitter feed that happened, um, again, and a goal to create awareness about diabetes, they're talking about type two diabetes being something that can be reversed or replaced in remission or prevented altogether if you had just had the right kind of lifestyle, which is eating low carb. Um, and so that is, an, again, another lifestyle kind of um, lingo that happens when we talk about type 2 diabetes. So that kind of leads to this diabetes can be reversed or prevented. Again, that lays into that lifestyle thing, but um, having this idea that type 2 diabetes can be reversed or prevented in most cases also can be quite stigmatizing because they look at it or people look at it as you're choosing to remain diabetic or you're choosing to remain having diabetes um, because things like diabetes are pretty simple. In this example, you can see um, a co-leader of a study that was looking at diabetes reversal talked about diabetes being, being a very simple condition that was really related to someone's body size or the amount of fat that someone has. And so getting rid of the fat means you reverse diabetes. Again, making diabetes very simple and very um, not very complicated. And again, making weight, uh, which is linked to diabetes, a very simple thing as well. When we know, as you'll see here in a few slides, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as people portray. 
And so again, this um, link to weight loss is is a stigmatizing message because a lot of the messaging is saying that weight loss is possible for most and is needed to manage diabetes well. You'll see that in the American Diabetes Association guidelines and talks about weight and, and those kinds of major um, publications and major corporations and organizations across the U.S. And you'll also see that in the, the media that it's really glorified if you are able to lose weight and keep weight off or show others how to lose weight. And you can see there's an example here where they talk about Paula Dean, um, that she would be a goddess if she could learn how to lose weight and teach others how to do that. And finally, when we talk about diabetes and some of that road most traveled, another really stigmatizing or common message that you may have heard or read about is that using medicine basically means you didn't do enough to take care of yourself. So medication is a sign of failure in a sense. And you'll see that, again, this is another um, publication that was online where they talked about time and effort uh, usually equals for most people, a management of diabetes through through diet or lifestyle, that medications really are not needed um, if people were, are diligent enough and have enough time to be diligent. And finally, this is a promotion for gastric bypass surgery. And I think this is probably the one that's probably the biggest gut punch of all, because the question is, why have you chosen to remain diabetic? So the insinuation is that you can fix this problem. And if you haven't fixed this problem, there's a reason or there's, a, there's, a, there's something wrong with you. The, why would you choose to have diabetes when it's a fixable thing? So all of these road most traveled messages really stop at this dead end of um, diabetes, basically anything diabetes related, whether it's a diagnosis or complication, is pretty much on you. It's your fault, it's your um, problem, and it's your condition. And it's, it's simply because you weren't diligent enough in your self-care. And I think that we need to hit a major reset button on that messaging. And I think that messaging tremendously undermines your ability and our healthcare system's ability um, and the people around you that love you and support you for your diabetes, through your diabetes journey. It really can cut the legs out from under all of us um, in helping support what you need because the messaging can be very, very stigmatizing. So if we hit reset, and we go down a road less traveled. I'm going to have you get in the back of my little taxi and we are going to go down that road and we are going to try to challenge some of the most common uh, messages and beliefs about diabetes. And we're going to do it through research. Okay. So first message that I want to take is that lifestyle piece. And I want to take it away from you because diabetes is complicated and it has many factors that play a role in developing that condition. Let's look at the first step. One example, I want you to grab a piece of paper. And if you have to pause me to do that, go ahead. But grab a piece of paper and I want you to make a T-chart. And on the left side of the T-chart at the top, I want you to write things I could have changed, okay? And on the right side of the T-chart at the top, I want you to write things I could not have changed, okay? When you do that, you'll see there's numbers along each of these points here on this page. So it says type two diabetes risk factors. There's 12 different points. I want you to just write the number of each point on the side you think it goes with. So for example, overweight, obese, your body size. Do you think that's something that you could, a risk factor that you could have changed? Or do you think that's a risk factor you could not have changed? And so I want you to put the number one on the side you think corresponds with that risk factor. And I want you to pause me and I want you to go through all of that, one through 12, and I want you to do those pieces. Put them on the side you think they fit. So I'll give you a second to pause me to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to circle them. And so I left number eight uncircled because really that for the 99% of people, 
most people not being physically active is something that they can do something about. Even if you live with chronic pain, even if you have um, complications of diabetes, there are ways that we can move um, and do things to help our body. There are sometimes you can't, but in the majority of cases you can. Now the things that are circled in blue are typically things that you don't have any control over. Um, and the things that are in white I circled because um, sometimes there are things you can modify, some things there, sometimes they're not things you can modify. I, for example, number five is high blood pressure. I have a family full of high blood pressure on one side, um, low blood pressure on the other side. And um, for the family members that struggle with high blood pressure, it really was not related to anything that they did with their lifestyle. Um, they were diagnosed incredibly young in their 20s, my mother and my grandmother. Um, and they, uh, they really didn't do anything to cause the high blood pressure. It was just a genetic piece or a genetic factor that it's kind of in our family line. So that's why those are circled in white because they could kind of go either way. So I have another page for you and I want you to do the same thing. Pause me, go through 13 through 22 and I want you to um, put the corresponding number on, on the side that you think it goes with. So, you know, put it on the side you think if it's something they can modify or change versus things you can't. So again, uh, many of these things are circled in blue are things that you don't have a lot of control over. And the things that I circled in, in white, there are things, again, that are typically hard to change. Most people are not gonna be able to change those things. Um, and I left 22 open again, because I think we all can find better ways to connect with other people and social supports. But I I'm hoping that this highlights that there are many things that are, linked to type 2 diabetes that are beyond the traditional lifestyle things that are talked about. And especially on this page, you can see that there are many environmental or social things that are linked to diabetes diagnoses that are commonly not discussed as well. So these are huge pieces that I want you to take away from this first stop on this less traveled road. The second stop I want to look at is how our health is determined based on all these different factors. So you hear people talk about, well, I have a genetic, you know, a genetic connection to diabetes. So I have a family history of diabetes. So I knew it was going to happen to me. Um, and genetics do play a role, but you can see on this circle graph that, or this pie chart, that the genes and the biology play a small role. And bigger roles are our access to health care, our health habits, and some of the social environmental pieces that play into our health as a population. So just as we can't discount genetics as our destiny, we also can't discount that there are a lot of social environmental things that play into our health that often are more impactful or more influential than, than we give them credit for. Um, traditionally, health habits only amount to 25 to 30 percent of what makes up our health overall. Other pieces, like you saw on the risk for di to diabetes factors on the last page, are related to a lot of social environmental things. So the third stop on this untraditional uh, travel or this less traveled road is what we know about preventing type 2 diabetes. Remember some of that messaging, if you just had the right lifestyle, that that would have prevented type 2 diabetes. Well, they did a study, and this is something you've probably read or heard about. It, um, it's called the Diabetes Prevention Program. It is now a program that is throughout the United States and covered by Medicare. Um, but it is a program that was looking at, or a study that was looking at, can we delay the diagnosis of diabetes? Can we prevent diabetes? And what they found was um, that when they broke people into three parts in the study, there was a group of people that didn't have anything different that they did. They just, they didn't do anything different. They kept doing what they were doing um, with their own health routines and medical appointments, things like that. They had a second group of people that took metformin, which is, as you know, a medication that slows the progression of diabetes or 
is used for diabetes management. And the third group of people were um, given lifestyle interventions. So they were asked to move more um, up to 30 minutes a, a day, five days a week. Um, they were asked to eat less calories and they had really close contact with dietitians or psychologists or um, exercise physiologists, so medical personnel. And what they found at three years is that the people that um, had the lifestyle interventions, they had a 56% less chance of developing type 2 diabetes compared to the people that didn't do anything at all. And the people that took metformin, they had about a 34% less chance of developing diabetes than the folks that, um, that didn't have any intervention at all. So there was a significant impact on doing something, whether it was a medication or um, a, a increase in activity and a decrease in eating patterns and close contact with medical teams, that there was an impact on your risk for diabetes. Well, what happens when you zoom out and you go 15 years down the road? So they looked at these folks 15 years later, that difference was significantly less as you go further away from that study and the intervention of that study. And so what ended up happening 15 years later is that metformin and lifestyle routines still made a big difference compared to people who did not have any intervention done at all. So people that were on metformin or did the lifestyle changes, they had about a 78% less chance of developing diabetes compared to the people that were, um, or excuse me, six to seven percent, compared to the people that didn't have any intervention. However, the other thing to keep in mind that these studies showed was that regardless of what group people were in, whether they were taking metformin, whether they were doing lifestyle changes, or they were doing nothing at all, regardless of what group they were in, if their blood sugars did not return to normal ranges, if they stayed in that pre-diabetes range, then their risk for developing diabetes was significantly higher. It was like a 56% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So that goes to show that there are processes that happen in our body and in your body as you develop diabetes that might be slowed but may potentially not be able to be stopped completely. Um, or that if we cannot reverse that process early on, if it's if you've um, had prediabetes for a number of years and that process hasn't been interrupted early, early on where the blood sugars can return to normal, then your chance of developing diabetes is, is much higher regardless of your efforts. So what happens with this one way thinking about lifestyle is that we create diabetes stigmas and a lot of public health campaigns emphasize the individual's responsibility or your responsibility in your health and that creates a lot of blame that's a blame campaign where we're talking about um, someone's individual responsibility for preventing diabetes or managing diabetes um, and we really create uh, highlight on the lifestyle piece and blow that picture up when we under when we know from the from the data and from many different studies and from the you know even the centers of disease control and prevention that lifestyle is a smaller piece of a bigger picture when it comes to our health. We also know that stigmas play a big role in how you can get your health care. So stigmas have been widely studied and widely documented in the research when we look at people trying to access health care. And those stigmas could be based on racial stigmas. They could be based on weight. They could be based on certain diseases. Um, and so it makes it difficult for you, the person living with diabetes, to get um, help in preventing diabetes or help in treating diabetes or complications of diabetes um, or help trying to maintain the quality of life that you have. Those stigmas play a big, big role in that. And I think we need to really continue to start breaking down those stigmas so that we can make sure that you're getting the access to care that you need in a timely fashion. So here's another road 
another path of our less traveled road, which is diabetes remission isn't easy or common. So you might hear or have read multiple different things about diabetes remission, but these studies have so many flaws and they, it's not very common to meet someone who has um, put their diabetes into remission. And let me point out a few of those pieces of why that is. The first is that your body has a number of things that are misfiring or misregulating and causing high blood sugars. Simple example would be the kidney. So you can see on this screen here, um, there's multiple different body parts and these are just a few, but on the kidneys, underneath the kidneys on the left-hand side there, you'll see it says glucose stays in the body. So normally, if we didn't have diabetes, if our blood sugars got to a certain level, our body would filter that sugar out into our urine. Well, in type 2 diabetes, the body doesn't do that as well, and it tends to hang on to that glucose and let it recirculate in your blood. And so your blood sugars end up being higher than they should be. And that is just one simple example of diabetes and the misregulations that can happen. They actually call this the egregious 11. It's a fancy way of describing 11 different factors that play into the, the level that your blood sugars get to or, the, or how your blood sugars get elevated in a diabetes diagnosis. And there are a number of different um, medications that people use that help re-regulate these misfiring pieces. So I call these like missing pieces. Our body's not regulating these pieces or your body's not regulating these pieces when you have diabetes. And so by taking a certain type of medicine, we can start that process of the body working the way it's supposed to. The other thing that makes remission really hard is the progression of diabetes. Diabetes naturally changes over time. And if you look at this graph on your screen, you'll see four lines. There's a black line that's called insulin resistance. There's a bluish green line that's called insulin levels. A gray line, which is the insulin making cells called beta cells. And then there's the orange line called blood sugars. And at the very bottom, you'll see no diabetes, prediabetes, type two diabetes diagnosis, plus five years. And the very end of that graph under me, it says plus 15 years. Well, you'll notice that when you don't have diabetes, all of these different levels are pretty um, even. They're, they're in line, they have all in check, all of those things. But once you hit prediabetes, the insulin resistance, resistance piece goes up, which means your body is not able to use insulin well. Um, and so what your body does, which is amazing, is it makes more insulin to try to compensate for that. But there becomes a point where your body isn't able to do that. And when you hit a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, that is when the blood sugars really start to rise and the amount of insulin your body makes really starts to drop. And over time, the longer you have diabetes, the more those blood sugars are going to be harder to manage with just lifestyle interventions. It's going to take medications. In fact, many people, when they hit 10, 15, 20 years into a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, end up requiring insulin because the amount of insulin their body makes has dropped significantly. And you'll see that on that green line and that gray line that, that the amount of insulin the body makes is less. So what that means is many people take medicines for diabetes. It is not a sign of failure. It is an expectation that we have knowing how the body works that you may need medication at some point to manage diabetes. Unfortunately, it's not always presented in this light. It's always, sometimes it's presented as, you know, your other medicines have fail, failed or you're failing your lifestyle pieces. We have to add medicine. Um, but you're not alone in needing medicine. It is not a failure. And in fact, more people, out of, more people than not require medication to manage their diabetes well. So what about the reversal studies? You remember I talked about those reversal studies have a lot of flaws. So what are some of those flaws? One of those flaws is that these studies are laced with really severe calorie restrictions. Um, you know, people are eating or drinking about the same amount as a toddler or an infant. 
um, the gastric bypass recommendations for people that have gastric bypass. Again, gastric bypass um, surgeries are often highly promoted as a way to manage diabetes or to reverse diabetes. Yeah, people are eating, you know, typically 900 to 1,000 calories a day long term um, to maintain that weight loss. So remember that the surgery itself is one piece, but the um, but the night, you know, the number of calories they have each day, that's a totally different piece of that puzzle. And that's not very much to live off of. Another example is the direct study, which was a study done on diabetes reversal, diabetes remission. There are so many flaws in that study. I could go on for days, but they were limited. The folks in the study were limited to 800 calories a day. To give you a perspective, that is like two and a half avocados for the whole day. That's all you get all day long. And they did that for six months. So um, just to give an additional kind of uh, context to how strict these calorie reductions are, there was a study done in World War II called the Minnesota Starvation Study. If you ever get a chance to look it up and read it, you should. It was very, very interesting. It is one of the, um, it is one study that we rely on to determine how starvation impacts the human body including the mental health. And so this study was done in an effort to figure out how they were going to help many of the people that were starving during World War II. And how do you reintroduce food to people and, and help people? So they took 36 men, healthy men, volunteers, and they reduced their calories um, to 1600 calories a day. And over the six month period, they these men would have fixations on food, they had cold sensitivity, mood changes, they had, um, they had uh, a low uh, libido, they had obsessions with food, they would add water to their food to try to make it feel like they had more. So there were, there were many, many impacts on these men's health. And that was at 1600 calories a day. When you look at the direct study and some of the side effects when those people were eating or drinking 800 calories a day, they were, um, they were very, very similar to the Minnesota starvation study. So look it up, check it out. It, it is really eye-opening when you look at the person, you know, when you get perspective of how many calories that actually is compared to um, men that were starving. Another really quickly, another remission flaw was that everybody kind of used different A1C levels or different timelines or different levels of medication use to define remission or reversal. So if you were to try to mimic what a reversal program would be, you are going to have a lot of different levels of, um, of, of ways that the remission is determined. So it's really hard to say what's remission, what's reversal, and all of those pieces because everybody defines it differently. And for example, Ver, um, Verda Health is one that they do a lot of the keto um, nutrition, so basically kind of like a ketogenic diet. And they boast that 60% of their people experienced remission of their diabetes, yet they allow people to continue to use metformin. And they include those people as people who have diabetes remission. So if we ex so if we took that group of people and we removed the number of people that were using metformin and the remission rates were actually closer to 25%. So that's just an example of how marketing about diabetes reversal or remission can be pretty skewed and misleading because um, most people that I've talked to that look at diabetes reversal or remission are looking at, I'm getting off all of my medicines and, all, and, and those kind of pieces. So, um, so those kind of pieces. So that's the thing that um, just to be aware of and to be cautious of. A um, couple more pieces on this remission because I think it's so fascinating how we can look at certain things and conclude that they're really good for people with diabetes, yet there are so many flaws. Another flaw that's out there is the dropout rates. 
so many people drop out of these studies that it's really hard to capture what are the true remission rates. So for example, the Swedish obese studies subject, or excuse me, subject study was a, a huge study that they did for people um, that had gastric bypass surgery. And one of the biggest studies that we have. And they had 3,500 people that were involved in the study at year two, but by year 10, there were only 1,268 people left. So we're missing 2,200 people. Well, if they say, let's just pretend, um, let's say 500 people at the end of the study were in diabetes remission. If they said that 500 people were in remission, 500 out of out of the 1,268 people is a pretty high percentage, just like 39% or something like that. But 500 people out of 3,500 is like 14%. So it really matters on how many people are really there at the end of the study. We don't know what happened to those 22 other 100, 22 other 100 people. Did they experience diabetes remission? Or was it the other direction? Did they gain weight back? Did they have trouble with diabetes? Did they have other complications of the surgery? So it's really important to understand that these data and statistics can be, again, quite skewed. And finally, you know, these people in these studies, they had all the resources in the world. Many weight loss programs are very expensive. They're not covered under insurance. Um, a lot of these people in these studies um, had to restart supplements. Um, if they started regaining weight, they had to add di um, weight loss medicines in um, when they started regaining weight. And regaining weight is a normal thing that happens for people with, um, that have tried to lose weight and maintain that. But it's, it begs the question, is it remission or is it active diabetes management? Um, because there's a lot of intervention that still happens. It's not like people are just cruising through the end of these studies. They're really having to stay engaged and dedicated to the plan. And even then, um, year over year, the remission rates um, decline. And so when we look at everyday folks like you, um, that aren't doing these types of studies and programs, what is the chance of, of having diabetes remission? And the chance of having diabetes remission is that it's pretty slim. So there's lots of different ways that it's, it's um, described or identified, but I'll just highlight the prolonged one. The prolonged remission of diabetes is defined as an A1C less than 5.7% for five years or more. So the amount of people in, um, when they looked at 122,000 people in a health system, less significantly less than 1% experienced prolonged diabetes remission. Um, as far as partial remission, which is the, the, the most lenient way to define diabetes remission, um, which is A1C less than 6.5% for one year. Um, again, only a little more than 1% of the people were able to achieve that. So in a nutshell, if you've had diabetes more than 10 years, if you use insulin, your chance of remission is lower. And that is true across all of the studies. All of the studies, again, show decreases, decreases of remission rates year over year over year. In my professional opinion, this does not show that diabetes can be placed into remission. In fact, it shows that diabetes is progressive, that um, if someone is not able, if their body is not able to help them maintain diabetes remission, um, with all of the resources that these people had in these studies, it just shows that, it, that diabetes progression is really um, something that we have to take seriously. And um, we can't I don't think that we can um, confidently say that remission is something that most people will achieve and be able to maintain long-term. So another complex piece of that more road, more traveled is the body size piece and the weight piece, which is often talked about in diabetes. So I wanna take you down a different route, which is um, that body size is complicated and it's not easily be easily changeable long term for most people. Let me give you an example. We usually hear that di um, body size is calories in versus calories out, and that equals your weight. So whatever you eat, 
minus however much you exercise, that's what your body size is going to be. We know, however, that body size is affected by way more than that. It's affected by how our food's made and endocrine, hormones, medicine, stress, sleep patterns. I, I, it's endless on how our body um our body size is impacted by multiple different things besides the calories in versus calories out equation. There's even more research going on on the gut and metabolism and how some people's gut um, absorbs food at a different rate and, and things like that than, than other folks. So it's completely different for each person. To give you kind of some insight into body size realities and weight realities on weight shifts, let's look at the Biggest Loser study. So there's a group of researchers that decided, I want to see what happens to folks after they've been on the Biggest Loser. What happens to their bodies, um, you know, six years out? So they, they looked at multiple different things. And what they found was six years after being on the Biggest Loser, many of them had regained weight. They actually had um, low leptin levels, so they were really hungry all the time. Their hunger cues were kind of messed up, so they had high rates of hunger. They had lower metabolism, lower muscle mass, higher blood sugar levels. They tended to have to eat um, almost 700 to 800 calories less per day to try to maintain their weight or to prevent or minimize weight regain. So they really had a significant impact on their overall ability to, um, to manage their weight because of all of these different factors that had changed based on that biggest loser experience. So again, weight is not just as simple as calories in versus calories out. And when we make extreme changes to weight, um, it, this study shows that there are many things that are impacted by that, including metabolism um, and, and blood sugar levels and, and some of those things that we normally depend on to um, determine health. Another thing that is really important for you to, to realize is that weight is part of the homeostasis system. And homeostasis is a fancy way of saying that our body likes certain things within um within a certain range. So it, it does that to maintain health and function. So for example, your heart rate, it, you know, your heart rate is a certain speed. Too high or too low is not healthy and it doesn't allow your body to function well. Same with respiratory rate, how fast you breathe. Same with your body temperature, blood pressure, blood sugar, fluid volume, electrolytes, um, carbon, carbon dioxide and oxygen balance. All of these things are impacted by homeostasis, our body's effort to keep these things in a certain range to maintain health and function. Weight is no different. Weight, your body prefers to be a certain size. It has a set point that it prefers, and it is very difficult to move off of that set point, um, especially long term. The body will change hunger and fullness cues to try to help you regain weight to try to meet that set point or get back up to that set point. And there's been studies that show this to be true. And in 2007, this was one of the most comprehensive looks at all these different pieces of weight loss research, weight loss studies. They found that these studies had a number of flaws that dieters tended to regain weight, um, all of their weight within five years and that many dieters actually gained more weight than they lost. So they actually ended up heavier before they started dieting and ended up being that dieting was one of the top predictors of weight gain. Um, that was a conclusion by these researchers. So the reality of weight loss isn't as clear cut as what um, might be presented in the medical offices or online in the media. And there are um, ways that we grade the research on these weight loss studies. Um, so just like you would in school, you give a grade to the amount of research or evidence there is to show something to be true. And so one of the things that um, is graded as a grade A evidence, meaning there's lots of evidence that shows it to be true, is that lifestyle changes do not work in maintaining weight loss, that most people see the max weight loss in six to 12 months, and typically weight is regained by two to five years after that loss happened. 
And that's not everybody, but the majority of people experience that. And there's a lot of research to back that up. There is, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but there is um, exploration on whether weight cycling or that yo-yo dieting where you have increases in weight um, and then you lose weight and then you regain it back and then you lose weight and then you regain it back, whether that really negatively impacts health. Um, a lot of studies have been done on animals. A few have been done on people. The ones that have been done on people have shown that dieting and that yo-yo dieting, that weight cycling where weight goes up and down, has been linked to increased risk of, of heart events, strokes, death from heart disease, um, um, heart attacks, things like that. So it's apparent that that just that cycling and weight and body size can negatively impact your heart health, which is something I wanted to make sure you knew because you live with diabetes and we want to decrease the risk of, um, of heart disease or problems with your heart in any way, shape, or form that we can. So I want to highlight for you why body size is not always a great way to determine someone's health. Because you might be looking at that thinking, well, geez, thanks a lot, Megan. <laughs> okay, well, I can't lose weight, but I'm told I'm supposed to lose weight to manage my diabetes well. What am I supposed to do? So even though body size is often equated to health, so we usually think of thinness equals health, that's not necessarily true. Um, let me give you some examples. So our life expectancy in the U.S. has declined in the past few years, but the CDC has equated that to drug overdoses and suicide rates. So two things that are pretty far removed from body size. So the next thing to look at is that research has shown that people who are overweight, so a BMI that is in the overweight category, live longer than people with normal weight. And that's true of people with diabetes. So people with diabetes, um, they had a higher survival rate if they were overweight. Um, if they were obese, they had a higher survival weight rate um, versus someone who is in the normal BMI level. So it doesn't mean you should gain weight if you are in the normal BMI um, level, but it just should reassure you or let you know that body size, again, is not everything. And in some cases, it's shown to be a little bit protective in that overweight category um, as far as decreasing your risk of death. So our traditional thoughts about health versus somebody who's unhealthy is that people in that normal BMI category, the green line, are healthy and anybody over that um, and body size, so higher BMI levels of overweight or obese, are unhealthy. That's our traditional look at health in this kind of culture that we live in. The reality is, based on some research, there are people that are unhealthy and healthy in all categories. So just because somebody's thinner doesn't mean they're healthy. Just because someone's heavier doesn't mean they're um, unhealthy. And so it's just really important to understand that people can be healthy at different sizes, um, and they can be unhealthy at different sizes. It's also important to note that people that are thin and unfit, they tend to have a higher risk of death than people who are fit and over uh, and, and obese. So it, again, weight is not everything. What is important is how we manage our health. What actions do we take? So if body size can't be modified or changed very easily, and we know that there are people who are living in larger bodies that are um, more fit and healthier than people that live in normal size bodies, what is the difference? What are people doing to maintain that health or achieve that health? Well, this study looked at over a thousand, or excuse me, 11,000 people, and I got to move me out of the way again. Um, and they wanted to see if health habits made a different in some, difference in someone's risk of death. So if you'll see they have people, um, or excuse me, you'll see that the on the chart here, on the chart, there's different BMI levels. So the, um, the, dark, uh, the lightest on the very left, the lightest line on the very left is the normal BMI under each number. The middle bar under over each number um, that's kind of like a little bit lighter gray is the overweight category. And then the darkest bar on the right of each number um, is the highest weight category where people would be considered obese. 
So this is the number of people that died, would die, had a potential of dying based on their health habits. So we look at zero health habits, people were more likely to die if they were obese. But as people add in more health friendly routines and health habits, one, two, three, four habits a day, or excuse me, a week, then, um, then the risk of death goes down significantly. It's almost um, equal if people have healthy habits and healthy routines. By the time somebody gets up to four healthy habits a day, body size is pretty much thrown out the window and everybody has a pretty similar risk of death. And I just put on the left side of the screen there the health habits that this study looked at. They looked at how many fruits and vegetables are people eating daily, how much exercise are people getting, um, how much alcohol people drink, and if they were smokers or not. So if people had these four health routines or four health habits, no matter what their body size was, then their risk of death was pretty similar. That should be encouraging news, I hope. It's a, um, something I want to highlight is that when we talk about weight, it can be very stigmatizing. In fact, weight stigma is considered um, greater than racial stigma as far as its impact on people. And stigma, weight stigma is basically um, judging somebody, somebody or stereotyping someone based on their body size. And it happens all across different settings, just like racial stigma would, would be in different um, environments and in different ways. What happens is this creates a lot of social stress, which increases someone's risk of death. Um, you know, people tend to eat more, move less. They have higher levels of stress hormone called cortisol, and they tend to gain weight. So in itself, just talking about weight um, in a way that can be very stigmatizing for people, that can actually lead to poor health habits and poor health overall. And people who experience weight stigma typically are less likely to access a healthcare system and are more likely to receive inappropriate care. And that's something I have definitely seen in my experience working with people with diabetes as care often gets delayed based on someone's body size. So what can you do? There are, here are some quick things that you can do um, to manage diabetes well and take out some of the stigma sting that happens. The first is focus your energy on self-care actions over your body size. We talked about how body size is not the end-all be-all in managing diabetes and unhealthy blood sugars, get, going from unhealthy blood sugars to healthy blood sugars does not just happen with weight loss. Too often we give weight loss the credit when there are many different actions and self-care things that people do that happen, you know, irregardless of somebody, whether somebody loses weight because of these actions, these things we know can lead to healthy blood sugars. That's getting more sleep, eating more mindfully, taking your medicine consistently, um, working on stress reduction, using technologies, having support systems, being more active. All of these things will help your blood sugar levels regardless of your body size and what changes happen with your body size. The other really important thing is to re-gauge your diabetes success um, from that weight loss mentality to healthy A1C blood pressure cholesterol and, and stopping smoking. If you can use that as your gauge of success, instead of the weight loss as your gauge of success, you're going to do really well because we know that from that people that have healthy UNC, healthy blood pressure, healthy cholesterol levels, um, people that don't smoke, and in this study that we looked at, um, have healthy levels of, of urine protein, so they don't really have a lot of protein in their urine, they had a significant impact on their heart disease. So people that had all of those healthy A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, all of those things I just mentioned, they had little to no risk of death from a heart attack or stroke um, or death from heart, any kind of heart event compared to the general population. This was a study of over a quarter of a million people that looked at if those things are in healthy ranges, can people with diabetes actually do well um, as far as their cardiac health or heart health? And the answer is yes. So gauge your success, your diabetes success on that gauge um, instead of the weight loss gauge. 
find those who are empathetic and work to reduce stigmas. So empathy is kind of like your airbag. It could literally save your life. There have been studies that have shown um, people that have empathetic doctors or healthcare providers have lower A1C level or levels, they have lower cholesterol levels, they have less risk of diabetes complications. And there was a huge study that was done um, that showed that the risk of heart-related death was 40 to 50% less when people with diabetes um, recognize their medical provider as an empathetic provider. So they, if they felt their provider was empathetic, their risk of death was significantly less from a heart-related event. And that was a study that was done over 10 years. So look for weight-neutral healthcare professionals. Look for people who are not gonna fixate on your weight um, as, a, as a gauge for managing diabetes. Look to peer support that doesn't fixate on weight. Um, look for peer support where, there, where people are looking at actions and over, over weight loss. And go to diabetes self-management training. Visit with diabetes psychologists. They can help you build coping skills to navigate some of these tough, tough social situations like weight stigma and disease stigma. And find, uh, finally, fit diabetes into your world. Um, too often, you know, we, you get your tank goes empty. Your, your diabetes plan pulls so much from you because you're stressed or you're overwhelmed. You feel like you have to eat a certain way where you're going to hurt your body or you're um, feeling overwhelmed and hopeless because you can't get the weight off and um, your blood sugars are high, you're isolated or ashamed. All of these different things, that's not health and that's no way to live. So look at a diabetes care plan that maintains social connections, the pleasure of eating, the enjoyment of movement and activity, something that provides the least intrusive, least restrictive way to help you achieve the healthy um, A1C blood pressure, blood pressure and cholesterol levels. So diabetes management is not just about food and body size. It's not just about lifestyle. It is a lot bigger picture than that. And you can manage it successfully and you can have a beautiful life with diabetes um, if you take the road less traveled and you look at a lot of those different pieces for your diabetes health and success. So thank you. Ah, thank you for riding along with me. I hope that you learned something new today and I hope that this conversation and this discussion helped you walk away with um, with a little bit more confidence about your diabetes journey and the pieces of your diabetes journey that are not your fault. Diabetes is not your fault. If you want to get a hold of me, if you have questions after you watch this, I'm happy to answer those and I would love to hear from you. You can see my contact information down below and you can always check out the podcast anytime you have a chance. We'll talk to you later. Thanks so much for having me.